and all the participants to be safe and everything to go smoothly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 I want to ask everyone quickly to please ensure that your mics are muted so that we can hear all of our speakers. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as we celebrate, as this great party celebrates 66 years of existence, his birthday being on the 27th of April, we're going to be discussing securing Barbados' food supply for the next 66 years and beyond. Joining us tonight is the CEO of Barbados Agriculture Society, a former member of Parliament for St. Michael West Central, for St. Michael West Central, yes, Mr. James Paul. Along with him, we have former Senator and current representative for St. John, who will be hoping to ride, who will be hoping to be the representative for that seat in the next election, Mr. Andre Worrell. And then we have a member of the Young Democrats and also an agro entrepreneur, Mr. Michael Rogers. I want to say good night to you guys on the, on the panel. And I want to first ask Mr. James Paul to just give an introduction to himself as the CEO of the Barbados Agriculture Society. Thank you very much, um, Corey. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me this evening to be part of this panel. Um, as I said, you indicated, I am the CEO of the Barbados Agriculture Society. Um, and of course, I've been associated with the, the Agriculture Society for well over 20 years. Um, and basically have been involved in all aspects of agriculture in Barbados. Um, of course, this is a very difficult time that we're going through at the moment. But I will hope that, you know, as we go through the discussion this evening, that we can sort of throw some light on a lot of the issues that confront the agricultural sector and maybe come up with realistic approaches towards helping to resolve those issues as we go ahead at this time. Thank you so much, Comrade James. And I will now invite Mr. Andre Worrell to say a few introductory remarks. I think for some strange reason, Andre may be getting a little um, difficulty with actually hearing me. Andre, can you hear me? Mikel, can you? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, sir. Right. Good night. Michael to give us an introduction. To yes, good night. Here. Good night, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Rogers. I'm a young, budding farmer, businessman, in love with agriculture. Um, just a short brief about me travel the Caribbean region, studying all aspects of agriculture, um, mainly deal with pigs and crops. Um, currently trying to find a solution just like Mr. Paul for the agriculture uh, problems we face. And I hope tonight um, I want some questions from the public. Everyone has to have some idea or something that we could bring together to help us um, formulate a plan. It doesn't have to, we don't have to be in government to come up with a solution, but I believe we as private citizens can come with a solution for the future. You know, because this is one Barbados and without food, we can't feed ourselves, you know. So looking for a free discussion. Thank you so much, Miguel. And it certainly is impressive when people say that young persons are not interested in agriculture anymore. Uh, to not only know that you are invested and in participating, but as you say, you are in love with it. And uh, I think it's one of our real principles as a party to really find solutions to a lot of the issues which face our country. Uh, for sure, food security continues to be won for quite some time now. And even back over the last 66 years, as we evolved as a party, and we brought solutions to Barbados on the principles of education, agriculture, just to name a few also tourism and international business. And, and 
tonight being our coach is one where we must pay some attention. And I hope that we can have a great, great conversation coming out of it where we can really come up with some ideas to really go forward the way we want to see agriculture as we go forward. We've seen COVID teaching us a lesson where food security is very important. And even with the impact of the volcano in St. Vincent over the last two to three weeks, which has actually threatened some of our food imports. I'm gonna start with you, former MP James Paul. What would you say are some of the challenges that are facing farmers today? But first of all, the challenges are a, a major. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I, I want to begin with one that is not even out there in the public eye at the moment. We have a very vibrant um, livestock sector in Barbados. And certainly, um, we also have, as I some not want to agree with it, a very large um, fruit and vegetable sector in Barbados. In other words, on both counts, Barbados has traditionally been able to sustain both a livestock sector and a fruit and vegetable sector. And of course, we have our local cane industry that we are doing very well. You know, one of the, the, the first major challenges I think maybe that we're gonna have to confront is to look to see how we can reduce the extent to which the Barbados agriculture cannot benefit from what we will call capacity, scale of production. Because the challenge that we are facing in the world today is this, that in terms of the world market, Barbados is a relatively small player. And I will give you just a typical example in terms of a particular commodity that is traded in the world today, corn, for which last year, the price of corn, for instance, was somewhere around, say, $3.50 to $4 per, per bushel on the world market being traded. Today and now, that price has now gone to over $7 per bushel. And also, in line with that, the other major grains that we have have also increased around the world. Why I speak at start out with that and the price of corn is that the price of corn is a principal in, um, input into agricultural feeds, like stock feeds. And if that price goes up, what it is doing is that it is affecting the viability of the livestock sector. It is happening at a time when we have failed historically in the Caribbean to develop alternative local ingredients for livestock feeds. So here it is, of course, that we have a situation where one of the principal ingredients of livestock feed is going up worldwide. And in itself, it will have consequences for the competitive competitiveness of local livestock producers, especially, of course, for poultry producers, our pork producers, it will have consequences. And of course, our dairy producers, they will have consequences. In relation to fruit and vegetable production, one of the challenges major that we are facing today is the fact that, you know, it is amazing that we talk, we talk very well. But when it comes to walking the talk, we have difficulty. And this has been a problem of Barbados historically in terms of trying to walk the talk when it actually comes to agriculture. You know, I, I was, it was interesting for me to see last year the fact that a whole, a considerable quantity of land was actually filled up in St. John. I don't know if that land has anything on it today. But one of the challenges that we face, in the, especially in the fruit and vegetable sector, first of all, is to try to utilize the agricultural land that we have available for the consistent production of, of agricultural commodities, whether or not, in this case, we whether or not we feed for, for feed for animals or, for instance, for human or food for human consumption. These are real challenges because what we are seeing is that because of the lack of consistent policy direction from previous governments in terms of the use of agricultural land, in terms of the facilitation of agriculturalists in the utilization of that land, 
And in terms of providing a viable incentive scheme that the agricultural sector could, could, could survive on a long-term basis, you are sending mixed signals to the agricultural sector in terms of maintaining the viability of production. And one last point before, because I know other speakers that want to make a contribution as far as that, that is concerned, I want to make. Let us all face it. I know that many of us are preoccupied with the whole question of um, small producers and that we think somehow that by some magic that the, uh, the sector could survive off of small producers. The fact of the matter is that we need capacity in the industry. But to get that capacity, we need investment. We need to have a, an environment in Barbados where people who want to invest in agriculture can feel comfortable that when they invest in, in the sector, that they can make adequate returns to merit the investment that they are making. When you ask a, a young man or woman to decide that they need, they have a future in agriculture, and they do this, and then at the same time, the state does not have the type of enabling environment and enabling policies that permit them to be able to weather the storms. And one of the things we never must recognize, agriculture is different to a lot of other businesses. It is the only, perhaps I would say the only business that you can get into that within a few hours, that basically the fruits of your labor can be wiped out. Many say that, you take for what I'm saying. You can carry a crop for four months. And in the fourth month, you could have a problem and, you, and it can wipe you out completely. So that money that you would have invested is lost. The problem in this country is that we have a public that have a, a I call it a love-hate affair with the agricultural sector. In that while they understand that, at the same time, you have a, a situation where they balk. Uh, when that farmer gets that difficulty at that critical time, which by the way, is no fault of his own, they balk at investing or helping the farmer at that critical time to get over that hump. And I think maybe it is largely because of the fact that, you know, agriculture has an association in the past with slavery before, but I think really that we have matured. But the problem is that when you look at the way in which we function, how government functions today, and which is, has gone from government to government, we have not accepted the fact that agriculture needs special assistance from government. And that we must not, at the same time, delay a given assistance to the agricultural sector when it is most needed. Because one of the things about nature, if you don't give it at the time that it's needed, any assistance coming afterward is kind of wasted. And I, I say we want to start with those opening remarks in terms of the issues that confront the agricultural sector and some of the things that we need to change if we are to seriously consider moving forward with an agriculture, agriculture sector that will make a real contribution to the economic development of Barbados and also food security in Barbados at the same time. Thank you so much for that contribution, um, CEO Paul. I will pretty much come out to you because I want to actually get into to insurance for farmers also. I'm going to ask um, Andre by any chance. Can Andre hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I hope that you can hear me as well. I can definitely hear you. Um, before I ask you to make your introductory remarks, let me recognize your president, the presence of our president, of our president, of the Pisa, who's joined us 10 or 15 minutes ago. Good night to you, madam. And I look forward to having some remarks from you tonight when we get ready to wrap up our panel discussion. But let me ask you, Andre, as a speaker on agriculture, currently the shadow speaker for the Democratic Labour Party, to give us quickly your introductory remarks. Okay, good evening to other members of the panel and also to the members of the, the St. Michael Central branch. And I hope that everyone had a restful Heroes Day, especially with the good weather that we are getting the rain. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to speak on this topic today in terms of securing Barbados' food security. 
Now, when we think about our food security, we not only we must not only think about meeting that economic cost in terms of re reducing the food import bill, but if you would have no witnessed recently the natural disaster which occurred not in Barbados but in Saint Vincent, the ash fall from the um, La Soufriere volcano and how it would have cut off Barbados from um, air travel for a week. And also you would have seen the restrictions as well to during the COVID pandemic with persons not being able to fly, um, how the shipments into Barbados have also been reduced. So I would like to, for us to look at food security and food supply from that perspective in terms of being in a, in a situation where regardless of what happens, that we should be able to at least uh, feed ourselves for a good few months or even a year. And that is what the country needs to do. So I'm looking at food security, not just in being able to grow crops that will be able to reduce the import bill, but we also need to look at the, not just the crops alone, but in terms of developing the seeds as well so that we would have those available and also when you look at livestock in terms of things such as um, the black belly sheep and, and cows, making sure that we have um, banks, sperm banks um, available that we can actually reproduce all of the things that we need. And the way how the world is going, you have to prepare for a catastrophic event where we pretty much on this island might have to fend for ourselves for a couple of days or a couple of months even. So we must be able to do that in terms of food security. When I also think too that we can look at reducing the food import bill from over 700 million, and I agree with a lot of what James said in terms of the, we have to look at agriculture differently and look at providing the necessary uh, financing to farmers, persons who want to get into farming, realizing that farming is a risky business. So making access to insurance as well um, possible for farmers. And you also need to deal with things such as perennial larceny and all of the hindrances that would stop persons from getting into farming. When we look at food supply, we also, not just the big production, but what I have been seeing going on in Barbados as well in recent time, especially in COVID, you see Facebook groups such as Green Thumbs, where a number of persons have started to do their own backyard gardening, and they're quite proud to sh show that they're eating the food which they grew in their backyard. So we need to um, basically capitalize on that and not to let this trend or this movement die down and get more Barbadians into backyard farming. We also have a culture as well with the guys on the block who do it in a very, um, not in, in a very on the fringe way. Many of them are involved in animal husbandry. They would raise um, sheep, cows, or chickens, any of those things. And, you know, they take care of their animals in the morning and they come and lay them on the blocks during the day and they get them ready for market. So more of those things that we need to start looking at in terms of getting more people involved in the agricultural sector. And then we produce on the larger scale, more people can get involved on the larger scale if the avenues for financing is there in terms, and I would look at things that we, we, we change in the way how we add, do the incentives, not to make you pay and then get the rebates, but put more incentives up front. So those are the things that I would like to dwell on more as we look at how we, Barbados can secure its food supply. Thank you so much for that, Andre. Um, I'm going to continue on to Mikel and ask you, my fellow comrade, as a agro entrepreneur, what would you say are some of the challenges facing you guys today? Right. Well, I'm going to again to those who join. Um, I can take a slight approach to Andre and Mr. Paul. I think these, especially Mr. Paul, and Andre in previous discussions, hearing my rants about this constantly. I think the time about, I think we're, more, we're looking at it from tonight more, what these two speakers just said is a more social way to look at it. But if you look at it from a business angle, right? When you travel to most of these countries, um, during the, uh, for instance, a prime example, the mill industry in America, 
um, the big poor industry and the beef industry in America. Those are big industries. And due to the pandemic, with the crowd on the abattoirs, and then we saw the slow production. A lot of farmers in the states had to um, euthanize their pigs and a lot of animals because of the, the large people and the volume the restrictions to these um, big marketplaces. In the Caribbean, it's very different um, where we don't have any food industries. Jamaica is a prime example. You have the fish industries with rainforests. So farmers or any fishermen, they know well, look, if they have a glut, they know well, look, I can sell my product there. The problem in Barbados, we got a couple of large chicken producers like Chipmunk and Star Chick and a couple of others, Amir Chicken as well. Um, so the market is kind of clustered in chicken, but there's still room. Um, we see uh, with the pandemic, a lot of people start selling um, wings. You know, I think the wing market is big. Is that how you present it? Um, Mr. Paul touched on feed. I think I traveled to South Africa and I, there are a lot of different things. You don't have to use the corn. Um, also, if you're looking at the lamas in Barbados, I mean, we can't grow everything, you know? And we have a major problem. I'm surprised no one hasn't touched it yet. Farmers pay $7.70 a cubic meter for water. And there are only, I think, 16 water districts, like Mr. Paul, 16 water districts in Barbados. And you, you mentioned that you saw a lot of land in St. John being plowed up, and there's, there's no water, you know? It's very hard. Then you have to pay $7.70 a cubic meter. Well, other farmers pay 60 cents. You know, any mathematician here realizes the percentage that, that that is not feasible. So before we encourage anyone, those are some things we need to address first. Um, but my main thing is we need to develop food industries. Um, we see a lot of people making drinks, right? a lot of, uh, like say cucumber and ginger. If they had a company here who um, kind of put the drinks together and that's collected from farmers, that's an industry. People will be encouraged to grow more food. Once there's a price set, people will be encouraged. So when we're looking at encouraging people, we gotta show people the business side of things rather than just the social side. The social side is there. Everyone will do their small gardening, but if we don't show people where the money is, in the, in, it is it's gonna be very hard to sell. Because at the end of the day, this is, this is a love. You have to love farming. As Mr. Paul said, today you could have a crop and then tomorrow it going. And, and, that, and then that's not gonna be, easy for anyone to get up and go again. It's gonna be very, very difficult, you know, but I think we need to start with food industries and, and the market is big in the processing market. It could process fresh foods, despite the, the shelf flavor will be expanded, but it, that's, that's the business. That's, that's how the business is going nowhere away then. And it will always be. People like things, we don't want to wait a couple of days for something they want it now, preserve that they can, go again to use later on. And that's where the market is going. And if you sell that there, I think the investment will be a no brainer for anyone to come and do. But as soon as you go in that part about plowing land, uh, it's gonna be very hard to sell it. As a young person, it's gonna be very hard to sell it. So Miguel, let me ask you, with the, with the volcano occurring or currently ongoing in St. Vincent, and obviously the perceived shortage that will come about, from some of the crops being able to come over to Barbados and, and crops even being set back for maybe a year, in some instances, a year and some. Do you see that as an opportunity for local farmers here? What, what, what is your perspective on it? Yeah, it, it, look, Corey, it will be a perfect opportunity for us. But the thing about it is um, our, we don't have a structure here in how we grow our crops. And that's the thing. Um, most of the lands that I say river, you have river, you have the spring hall, and then you have other different districts. Those, we, didn't, we I think we know, the bit of rain we had today is very good for the wells. Um, it's gonna be very hard to fill that gap that comes out of St. Vincent. Very, very hard. Because every Tuesday, planting comes in here, you get breadfruits, you know, a whole heap of crops coming from St. Vincent. And with that, I honestly would love the opportunity, but realistically speaking, I don't think we'll be able to supply that. Role. It's going to be very hard. 
It's very, very hard. Comrade James, yeah. Thank you. Comrade yes. James, let me extend that same question to you, sir. Let me just say one, yes, it'll be difficult, but it can be done. It can be done. I, I, I just want to say because, you know, one of the things that, that people in the North teach us, make haste when the sun shines. We don't do that. We waste it. For instance, we have a season, and one of the things that we have not recognized in our agriculture at all, there are some seasons when it is quite appropriate for some commodities. Better not be, for instance, mangoes now should be in season. I, I noticed that this year, we have not seen the, 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 the kind of production that we should see from the trees starting early hasn't been there. You know what? The, I have not heard a person in the sector say, why? And not only that, we have not even sought to find out to research or whatever, why has it happened? Another point too, I, 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 I wish to make as far as this is concerned. Look, we have an excellent banana plantation here. I'm planting plantation of factory. We have an excellent one. I know that there's another one that's developing in another part of the island in St. George. So we, so we do have the capabilities, capability to do things. But you know, it all starts with a plan. And one of the issues that we have generally is that we talk about agriculture, but we don't start with the master plan. The master plan, I, I agree with Mikel. Mikel talked about the issue of water. Water is, 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 is certainly something that is critical for farmers. You cannot, at this, for instance, the current water rates that we have in Barbados are pushing some farmers out of production. And that is clear. And government is going to have to look to see how can we, how can we, how, how can we help farmers to pay the high water rates that they're experiencing right now? Because it is just for some like stock farmers and economical. On the other hand, you have some farmers that get in water 60 cents per cubic meter, which, which is, of course, it's very cheap. But on the other hand, other farmers who will want to engage in agriculture, they, they are not afforded to this. But there's a plan that we can, that we, everybody has to be a part of. For instance, I, I have heard the talk about water harvesting, but you know what? Water well, harvesting is something, these are things that we talk about for a few months because it sounds good, but then there is no master plan to see how do we continue it. For instance, if we are serious about water harvesting, there is no reason why that we should not be demanding of Barbadian householders that in every community around Barbados that we should be seeing tanks springing up around houses taking the water off of those rooftops. I ask any one of you, how much do you see that happening in this country? As a matter of fact, when I look at it, what I see instead is that those who can afford it put in tanks into their houses, and where do you think they get the water to fill the tanks from? The Barbados Water Authority. So you have a, a system that is already under strain, and the very system that we call water harvesting that we should put, should put into place it is not being carried through because we are fooling ourselves that the current amount of water that is in the aquifers can handle the pull that is there. And what it is doing, it is compromising our agricultural production too at the same time. That is what it is doing. So we, 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 have, we have to be serious. We have, if we are saying that we are committed to water harvesting, also too, we must have something in place that insists that even yes, householders in this country, okay, have some means that the keeping them honest in terms of if they're supposed to build tanks and water harvest, let us do it. There are areas in our urban, in, in our urban areas. I, I, in fact, I was called by a gentleman a few months ago. You know what his problem was? He has a huge tank before his, behold, below his house, holding over 5,000 gallons of water, but no place to go with it. You know what? We don't have a system in this country that, for instance, in areas where we have people who collect water, off the roofs, how do, who do they, how do they dispose of it? Do we have a system of tankers that allows that water to go to see the farmers who need it in different areas? We are building buildings in this country and the question needs to be asked, is the, is, 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 is the um, whoever is supposed to do, the, 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 to supervise that um, building, ensuring that first of all, that these people are collecting water and also, too, are they monitoring to see whether or not if they have a surplus of water, how can they deal with it? These are issues that we need. These are hardcore issues that we are avoiding because we like to sound nice and sexy on the top of it. But when it comes to the actual implementation of it, 
and ensuring that people are honest in the implementation, we don't do it. But who suffers at the end of the day? The farming sector, because as Mikel pointed out just now, okay, when we get water shortages for people who have crops that are in the ground, it's the farmers who feed it. I also, there are some people who also tend to feel that farmers are not doing what they have. Farmers have, are introducing the latest irrigation techniques that they can have. Drip irrigation, for instance, they are finding ways on trying to economize in the use of water. The, for instance, the whole, the whole um, thing you now about going into um, container harvesting of vegetables, all of this means that what we're trying to do, we're trying to recycle water and be as economical as possible. But we are being asked to hold on us. Well, on the other hand, we don't recognize that the activities are, are happening in other sections of the economy that impact. And I, I, do, I, I do think I, there's an opportunity for, yes, the increase of agricultural production in this country from the fact that St. Vincent is not able to supply us. Because as was, as I said, and I, and I referred to the land deliberately that was built in St. John. That land has not been put any crops on. The last time I went up there, it is back on the grass. And what I'm saying is this, that if we are serious, that yes, we can plow more land up in this country that will be able to produce some of these staples. Yams, for instance, is a crop that we don't speak a lot about at this point in time. But again, because of the fact that we have not, again, the consistent in terms of putting the resources into the agricultural sector over the years, we have again, falling down in terms of our production of yams in this country. These are areas that we, we need to pay attention to, but we have to be honest, we have to recognize that the agricultural sector, yes, can um, step up to the plate, but we also have the co to commit the resources at the national level to help them to be able to do the things that we want them to do. Thank you, Comrade Paul. Before I take this question from Morgan Graves, let me introduce Andre to come back and just give us his, his take, his perspective on uh, the opportunity or disadvantage that the impact of the La Sofia volcano St. Vincent can have on the agriculture sector here in Barbados. Okay, cool. um, Corey, like most of the others said, I don't, we're not at that stage yet where we can really um, take upon the opportunity of the fallout, but I'm hoping that we work towards it. And James mentioned twice about the land in St. John, and yes, that land is still idle. Um, it was promised to farmers since June of last year, and again, it was promised to them again at the start of the um, sugar harvest in February, and up to now, those farmers have not been allocated that land. If we move ahead with things like that, maybe we, we should be able to make up some of the shortfall, but it would be good to try to capitalize on it in terms of um, planting more crops such as the sweet potatoes and the yam, especially now this is a good time to be planting yams. And the banana industry, again, in parts of St. John as well, and the plantings, we can make use of it. We will benefit because many of the farmers are looking forward for the increase in production, the bloom, um, because of the ash fall and hope, hoping that it would have helped to fertilize a lot of the soil. One of the things that we have to be mindful of, we take for granted how much water is impacting this economy and having access to water. One of the reasons why you're seeing a number of the crop, um, the mangoes that James would have mentioned, not blossoming because we were not getting the rain, you're, um, bread fruits you're not getting the bread fruits that you would expect to be because they're all waiting for the rain to come um, to come true we have to do better in terms of being able to supply our farmers with water um and i think that one we need to do um things in terms of channeling a lot of this rain water from off of the roads into the gullies or damping in areas that you can just then draw on that water to take to the farmers um, where they need them. We also need to, farmers would have the drums in, in, in the fields with the drip irrigation, a system that you can be able to refill those drums so that when you go through a drought period, you do not necessarily lose your crops. But um, in terms of, and the next point, agriculture industry globally is a $2.4 trillion industry. We don't have to grow everything here in Barbados, but we need to get our farmers to the stage where 
farmers from Barbados can expand their businesses to other Caribbean territories and utilize those lands in terms of helping us to meet the full supply need. We don't have to grow everything here in Barbados. We are a small landlocked, we are a small country, but the throughout CARICOM, we have may be able to have access to lands that we can utilize that would be able to help us to produce the crops that we can then put on, on, on the market. We just need about $1 billion annually of that $2.4 trillion industry. But we can't get it here in Barbados alone, but if we go further afield, we might be able to. Well, do you know that recently over in your area, St. John, you guys had that water, the water issue going on. And obviously there are quite a bit of farmers over there. And even going back to what James was saying, and you were even saying, Going forward, how do you see us promoting and, and, and ensuring that persons really practice water harvesting? Because I felt that one of the things coming out of the, the, the whole St. Vincent Volcano thing is that beaches were never prepared for it. And as a result, and as a result, they were caught off guard. They, they needed water to get them, their places back in, um, in shape. And, and, and then you hear about the water crisis more and more and more and more, just showing you how critical and how easy water can become a, a precious commodity. Well, even more precious than it already is. Um, I believe, um, Corey, that we need to get back to basics. Um, those of us who live in the country would know that on many of the plantations, you pass, you see the well, a well in the middle of the field. In most cases, a lot of the channels to those wells have been blocked um, by new housing developments or the roads. So. Every farmer should look at some means in terms of capturing water on, on the property, in terms of um, either building a, a well, a dam, somewhere that they can capture water on the property and utilize uh, whatever technology is available to store this water and then be able to get it back into the fields. So we need to do a better job at this. I think where the government could also assist in terms of developing a policy the true the drainage unit, if there is still such a thing. We right. once before we started, when we started the drainage unit, it was because of the flooding that we were experiencing in Barbados and being able to channel the waters in, in the correct place. But not just to channel that water out to sea, but channel that water one um, into areas where it can be captured, and then you will be able to transport that water to the farmers where it is needed um, using the bulk truck. So we need to get to that technology. Wherever you have uh, roofs that the water can run off and collect, and most farmers already do this, start collecting that water. So we need to do a better job in terms of harvesting water and getting the water into the fields. Most farmers use drip irrigation wherever possible. And if they have the, um, the overhead um, sprinklers, if they have access to good water, they would use those. But you need definitely to work on in terms of not just to let the water run on the road into the sea and away from us, but you need to capture it. You need to get back into finding the, the wells in the fields, clearing those wells and making use of those wells in terms of for irrigation purposes, because water is critical to the agricultural sector. And without it, you will all, we will always go through this period because we are experiencing different longer drought periods in Barbados. And if we do not get control of this situation, it will mean that the agricultural sector in Barbados would not be viable. Thank you, Andre. Um, before I go to, to um, Mikhail and, and Comrade Paul about insurance for farmers, I want to, I think Morgan Graves had decided to ask the question. Are you there, sir? Mr. Graves? All right, um, Comrade Paul, let me come to you. Is there insurance readily available for farmers? Let me just say that in relation to the matter of insurance, you must have an insurable product in order for you to get insurance. That is, that is something that you get. If the product is not insurable, it is highly unlikely that you will get that insurance. The problem that we have is that a lot of the, 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 the equity 
in agriculture, a lot of the properties, are all the things that we are trying to insure are not just not insurable under norm under in, in insurance companies. In other words, you take for instance, how do you insure something when in truth and in fact you cannot secure it properly? You, you take a simple thing, a sugarcane production. How do you in, insure a sugarcane field when basically, first of all, is pests, but anybody can walk off the road, break cane, and basically deprive, deprive the insurer of what is actually there, or the owner of what it is. It's not, some of these things, I have, you have to look at it in a very practical way. Okay? Can it be insured? And if you weren't insured, would you want to insure it? Or could you insure it? If you go by the normal laws of insurance. The other point I wish to make in respect, even in livestock insurance, one of the things that defends us, and, and, that, and as a matter of fact, that is probably the only exception, where once burns or structures which house animals meet certain specification, in other words, that they are secure and the, and the, and the, the, the whatever the site to be protected, yes, they can be insured. You can get easy insurance. But the fact of the matter is that in other areas, where, for instance, you have cows, for instance, tied out at night, or they, they really in a structure, really, that is not safe, it is not secure, that anybody can get access to them. These are not insurable. That is why then I, I really believe that, first of all, let's be frank about it, that there are some activities in agriculture that cannot be insured through the normal means. So what does it mean then, as happens in other countries? I, I believe, therefore, that in a sense, that maybe you have to look at it, that government might have to undertake some responsibility there, but you have to be careful of that too, because there's also the argument that people will hold that the, a person has a responsibility, especially say in the case of livestock animals, to secure their livestock. So it is these things, and I think really that it is a very, insurance in a sense is a very difficult issue, but especially in, even in crop insurance, in most countries, what happens is that government subsidizes the provision of insurance when it comes to say crop insurance. And of course, with the vexing question of period larceny, which of course we have not touched on as yet, or I prefer to call it crop theft, livestock theft, the stealing of agricultural produce that is so predominant in this country now, okay? It even makes the whole question of insurance even more difficult. So, I, so in answering you, yes, insurance is available, to the extent where you can satisfy the insurer that you can keep the, the, the product that is being insured or whatever in a situation where you can, you can secure it, that, that there's adequate security to ensure that it's not stolen or anything like that. And, that, and, and I, I would say once you can satisfy those conditions at the moment, yes, it can be insured. But in other cases, I think government, you might have to look at some special fund which can help out those other um, agriculture commodities that don't meet those requirements. Thank you, Comrade Paul. Um, Mikel? Yes, yes, yes. Tell us from your end, as a, as a young business agriculturalist, I mean, how do you fear with, with these kind of challenges? Well, because again, it has I, to be tough. I, uh, well, it is tough, but I put pretty larceny insurance issue on the same level. But I also have to say, as a business that you run, you know, um, if I was if I was uh, the owner of Chefet or KFC or franchise owner of a KFC in Barbados, obviously I would have put some cost towards um, protection of my property, protection of my investment, whether cameras, footman, security, dog, you name it. Um, I think we rely, I think a lot of business people in general, um, you are from the informed business, I will consider our country informed business. Uh, we rely too much on government assistance. Um, when you hear sometimes how am I, how people are saying individuals, things are stolen. I mean, sometimes it's laziness, you know, especially with potatoes. I mean, sometimes I think you as a farmer, if you don't have the technology, I need to go and get up at night, break at night rest. And you know, go and surveil your um, surveil your property, or you invest some some dollar, some some part of the dollar should be going back into investment to security. I mean, there are a lot of technology, a lot of technology there in terms of like, as for instance, 
Um, I remember an incident in Jamaica where a couple of cows were stolen. And two weeks prior, they were getting ready for market and they, they sprayed this chemical, non-toxic chemical on the animal that would have, you, you would have seen an impression on the meat. But obviously the owners know that after four weeks time, that won't go through, that's passed through the animal's body. And as soon as they cut up the meat, they saw the dye in the meat of the animal. I mean, that's a part of the thing where you know you're getting ready to harvest, you invest in these technologies. And not to say these technologies are expensive. Sometimes Alibaba.com and, you know, we, we shop on Amazon, these everyday outlets. And I think it's something you have to, I think, I don't, I, I feel sorry for people when I hear these stories and don't get me wrong, but realistically, you have to look at this thing as a business, You're in it to make money. Um, the insurance part is a very hard thing. I can't blame insurance. I, if I was an insurance company, I wouldn't be putting my money to back anybody thing, even even if I was a supermarket buying a crop, there's no way can, the farmer can guarantee me that he can get X amount of pounds because that, that's just how the business is. You know, you, you, you just have to wait and just, as I said in my earlier comments, this industry is an industry today. Today you have something, tomorrow you're gone and you just have to find the strength in your system to get up and go again. But for the pre for the, for the stealing part, I think um, as you make money, a dollar should go into some form of security. Drone, I you know the drone technology law hasn't passed yet, but you know, simple thing as a camera. You know, you can get an outpost camera. Um, they're they're so small solar PVC systems that are very cheap. You know, you can set up. The sun is always shining in Barbados despite the last couple of days of the asphalt. But you can't rely on government for assistance. So I tell you, know, Mr. Paul, we, we always have this argument. The government can't provide everything, um, you know, it's going to be very hard. So I just think you got to think out of a business. Because if you own a franchise or any other business, you will think about breaking in, fire, you know, that's just how it is. That's just right, how it is. Before I um, think, um, Comrade Paul, you were saying something? Uh, All right, before I, um, I touch on Barbados' food in Port Bill, you were saying something, Comrade Paul? No, no, you go ahead. I'll come back oh, again. Okay. Right. Okay. Before I touch on um, Barbados' food in Port Bill, I want to give um, Comrade Shalang and see his hand is up the opportunity to ask this question quickly. Um, good night to everyone. Um, the cover of insurance, I'm just give you an example. If we insure 20 farms, the farmers have to make payments to the insurance company. The insurance company don't make pay, don't, don't make any investment. And it is like what is called a, a crowd thing, where you expect the, the insurers not to have to come to the insurance company and get money. So I am a great concern what insurance can at least insure a farmer. To the point where all right, you got a, a feel of $10,000 in crop for you then, and you lose 5,000, I can't do $2,000 to buy back the seed and start back the crop to reproduce to gain more. I don't know why that can happen. What insurance companies are complaining about loss in investment, but yet are pretty box of us in this country, they're getting millions upon millions of dollars every year. I am in a medical scheme, and I contribute to it, and I guarantee a few thousand workers in my, in my establishment, only 20 people just use it every year. So I am a bit concerned that in that story, that story to be done true. Other parts of the world, they do it. Right? They do it. So they got to come to a mechanism where, all right, we can ensure the farmers, they want to start from the point where, okay, you planting crops, people will give you the money to start by a crop. Whatever. Next thing um, I recommend is yeah, the embodied outreach of a community. Under the new building code for houses of a certain size, you have to build some sort of water straight from being water. Right? I know many people that build new homes that have water tanks that catch rain water have nothing to do with the water. The mechanism isn't there to uh, extract it from the tank. But as a child, how we support the farmers in the neighborhood, 
big farmers as, as that is, we kept the skins and such like in a bucket, and the farmers pass around and collect these skins to feed the pigs. So we can see if we can, those who harvest rain water, if the, the, the sector can, get a couple of their own tanks, and you harvest, you collect water from these people, you use it to provide uh, water for your agriculture. And like how oh, you used to do when you kill your pig or sell a piece of meat in this boy, let piece of meat. They will give a few products to the person as kind appreciation that. That's something you could think about, right? I do know that farmers try to harvest rain water. Some try to keep farms on their land, which is not enough. But that's something that we can think about. My concern with our water resource is we have developed the land too much for housing and we are allowing too much of the water runoff. When the land was in agriculture or growing bush, that rare water would stay in the land and go through the land. But because you are developing from agriculture land now for housing, that water isn't going into the ground no more. It is running down the road, down the hill, into the sea. Right? I, I totally agree with you there. I totally agree right, with you. I totally agree with you there um, on everything you say, the importance of, of um, the, the, the water, the water harvesting for sure. And also we're looking at the land development um, plan for Barbados, especially when we look at um, housing and, um, and, and agriculture. And, 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 and also obviously, you know, we have to put land, land space in place if the government is serious about the medicinal cannabis industry. I'm going to take one more question, the last one quickly from um, Comrade Khalil Patel in Canada, and then I would um, move on to Comrade Paul to discuss the food import bill. Um, Comrade Patel. You could hear me now? Yes, I can. Hi, good night all. Um, so this question is to James, Paul, um, what? So you mentioned about insurance. Have have the farmers considered captive insurance, where they can build a structure where they self-insure themselves, obviously with the help of government, to provide the initial funding and maybe every now and again additional funding, whereby they can invest that funding into. Um, secured investments to build to build that necessary capital in the event of a, let's say a flood or drought or what have you. What are your views on that? Thanks. Comrade Paul. Comrade Paul, you there? You need yes, to unmute. Sorry. Okay, I, I, I'm on mute now. Oh, so sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. But I, I was saying that, of course, anything that could be done to assist in terms of providing insurance to farmers is something, yes, that we would embrace. Um, and I, but, but you must be aware that I did indicate that there are some structures in agriculture that are insurable and some that are not. And I think maybe we have to look at those structures or those, those activities which somehow has not been able to attract insurance, to see how we can actually solve the problem. And if, if captive insurance offers the opportunity to, do, opportunity to do that, I think really that is something certainly um, that we, we would want to, 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 to move to. Um, but I think in a sense that farmers will need some assistance because remember the cost, people don't consider that the cost of getting involved in agriculture can be considerable, depending on the type of agriculture that you're actually looking at. So I think farmers will need some help. But I also want to go back to an issue which was raised, which today we have, we, we have lost over. And this is the question of urban expansion into agricultural areas. It is the most disgusting thing for any farmer anyhow to hear. When we talk about developing agricultural land into housing, because, because that is a misnomer. I, I don't see how you can take up valuable agricultural land 
and put it into housing. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest threats to agriculture in this country is where land is coming in to possession of people who have a speculative interest and who deliberately buy that land, leave it idle. They do not grow anything on it. They leave it idle for a number of years. And then when the time is right, they go to the government planning division and say, I have a piece of rab land, it is no good. And as a matter of some of them even take steps to compromise the land where they might engage in things to make sure that they get Topsoil degradation on the land. And we stop and we stay by in this country, although we love agriculture, we claim and watch it. Okay? And we rush to say because, you know, we're looking for some vote from somebody to go ahead and tell them, go ahead, take the land, compromise it, run it down, okay? And then they build houses on it. At the same time in this country, we have a situation where in our urban areas, we are suffering what I call urban decay. You take Bridgetown, and when we look at Bridgetown, the amount of empty office space that we have in Bridgetown, quite shame on the fact that we are permitting building contractors to go out in the countryside and take valuable agricultural land and put offices on it. In Bridgetown alone, in, some, in fact, in some residences or areas of, of St. Michael and Christchurch, you have empty houses. Houses that are just there empty, nothing, nobody in them. And what's happening is that we are allowing developers to go out there and take up valuable agricultural land. And again, do what? Put buildings on it and compromise that land. Land that, for instance, that could be producing food for people in this country. But you know why? Because of the fact that we have people who are coming into possession of the land who have a speculative interest in it. And the point, and also too, I also want to speak about the fact that I heard, I think someone made the, the, the point about, I think the whole question of runoff. The way in which we are pe permitting people to build houses or to build structures and land to do, we are facilitating, we are increasing the amount of runoff, rainfall runoff that is happening because if someone made the observation, really in truth and in fact, that we are actually blocking up the traditional drainage channels. And what is happening is that you can see it very obviously, there are some areas in this country that once rain falls, it floods, but we have floods in the streets and where does the water go down to the sea? And I, I restate the point again, because I heard someone speak about the fact, yes, we need to clear the wells that are there to make sure that water can get into the, the, the subservice to, to, to drain. But we want to state the point that we are neglecting and maybe we are not in, and, and not, no government today has enforced it. Whereby if we are serious about water harvesting, first of all, we need to insist that people start to harvest water off their roofs as a matter of immediacy for, for purposes such as washing down, washing your car, washing your driveway, things like that. But not only that too, okay? We, we, we also need to recognize that I heard someone say that, you know, some person has collected water, but there's no, they don't have a way of disposing of it. That suggests to me that we are not thinking, we are not thinking that when we are, do, when, when we are asking people to do these things, what is the plan going forward? How do we give it practical, give practicality to it? And we have to plan. So that's, that's what I'm suggesting to you, that for instance, on the question of the design of the houses, that we can do it, but, the, but it needs to be enforced because one of the greatest threats to agriculture in this country is the whole question of urban expansion, where we are permitting housing in areas that were previously exclusively agriculture. And let me permit the housing there. What it does, it compromises agricultural activity in the surrounding areas to them. And it poses a problem for agriculturalists on a whole. In other words, there are certain basic functions in agriculture that you have to, have, have to conduct and you cannot do it. 
in some areas because you are going to affect somebody who has a house somewhere down the road or somewhere close to you. So th th these are some of the issues, the real issues that our country faces. But you know, we don't want, we, we like to we like to talk glibly about the whole question of in, in, in um, increasing food production. And there are some very practical steps that can be taken even today to help to increase it. One other point I want to make in terms of the University of West Indies, because th this point we have glossed over again in this country and we have not referred to it. Some years ago, University of West Indies was granted some land at Dukes in St. Thomas. And it was to my horror when I learned what, what the University of West Indies wanted to do with that land. They wanted to put buildings on it. When, in a sense, the agricultural sector in this country is crying out for research programs that can help it to solve some of the many issues that are happening in this country. For instance, we might not know, some of the crops in this country, yams, for instance, there are issues in terms of the production of yams, caravan in this country, when it comes to potatoes, sweet potatoes. And we have a University of the West Indies in this country that speaks glibly about trying to encourage economic development and all kinds of stuff. But when it comes to actually doing the things that actually is going to facilitate and help farmers to do their business better, they don't want to touch that. But the land that was given to them at Jukes, look what they're looking to take with it, put a chocolate factory, something, of course, that we don't produce. We don't produce, we, 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 we don't produce cocoa in this country. <laughs> But on the other hand, so that increases that increases the import bill. Right, precisely. All it does is increases the import bill, and we want to put what exercise walks on in it. Look, the, the, the point that I, I'm making is that our best brains in this country need to be utilized at the service of the agricultural sector, not the other way around. They cannot stay up there being blessed by the government treasury all the time with all the money that they need. And at the same time, not do things that tie them in towards ensuring the success of the of, 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 of economic sectors like agriculture and, and, and engaging in activities that helps to achieve that success. That is what it should be. But we in this country double speak, we molly coddle, and we do not want to come to terms with reality and say to some of those people, look. It is all well to collect the other fancy salaries. But if at the end of the day, the ordinary man or woman in this country is not being served by what you are doing, you need to think again. And, and I'm saying that, and I'm, I'm saying that if we want the agricultural sector to progress, it's these things that we need to address. And in a real way, not by sort of talking and coming up with fancy for notions from time to time. We have it is it's really trying to make sure that we, we want to double our production over period and it can be done. But agriculturalists need to see something hard. See, same way that the tourism people in this country from time to time are able to get what they want. Even, even in the current thing, they get what they want. Agriculturalists have to beg and hope that something drop off the table at the same time. That is not the I think that, that over, over the last six to six years, our party has been instrumental uh, different times being the government of Barbados, playing a major role in things such as the um, the Barbados the island cotton industry. Also, there was the cotton mm -hmm. industry. There's the sugar cane industry. And as time has gone on and, and we have progressed um, through independence and beyond, I, I made a comment to someone the other day that as a little boy growing up, I find myself today buying the things that I used to pick and eat freely as a little boy. So you will pick donuts as a little boy and eat. You know, if you want don'ts, you got to purchase a bag of don'ts. Same thing occurs with sugar cane. Same thing occurs with, with, with tambourines, with gooseballs, with guavas. I mean, it's to the point where now I almost feel as if guavas are, are an endangered species. And and only only recently I was looking at, and you, you see that the food import bill in Barbados is over $300 million. And 90% of that is for you food which is consumed locally. Back in the day, we actually had an onion industry. Uh, we are not importing these kind of simple basic things. Now, how do Back we realistically, we're not just talking, but how do we realistically address our food import bill and get back to the basics? I don't know if we have gotten away from the ideals of where we were supposed to be 66 years ago when our party came into existence. And if we need to, to, to pull back in and, and get back there. 
Are you open that? Are you open that comment to, to all three of you? You know, look, I will jump in here. Because, let's, you say back in the day we had an onion industry. We have an onion industry still. As a matter of fact, let me put it this way, right? We are still growing close to at least over 100 acres of onions when year come. And each of those, each of those acres produce at least 50,000 pounds, around 50,000 pounds of onion. We, we're, still, we're still producing. The point is that we could do better. But, but the, the, the whole thing too, and, and I think that a point I want to make, we, I, I, I heard the interesting discussion sometimes, and I, I get controversial on this. I have no, no qualms about it. This issue of chicken wings in this country. Look, chicken wings, there's nothing fanciful about, fanciful about chicken wings. The only reason Beijing like chicken wings is getting because it was marketed as the cheapest part of the chicken. Why was it cheap? Because the United people in the United Kingdom and the US like the most healthy parts of the chicken, which is the breast part, okay? And they literally threw away the chicken wing because it was of no value to them. So we got it cheap from them, okay? What, what is happening now in the world today? Consumer tastes are realizing things are changing. So what we are seeing now in the world today is that, for instance, the price of chicken wings is going up worldwide right? because you know culinary tastes are changing and people, you know why we talk with the one people that like chicken wings because they're saying people are using it now for culinary delights. In other words, it has become more expensive. Not only that, more recently, United Kingdom, what has happened is that they have been hit by the avian flu virus. So basically, they are not, we cannot bring in chicken, um, chicken wings now from the UK because of the fact they are hit by the avian flu virus. And I get people calling me daily, James, I want some chicken wing. You've got a chicken, a chicken got a leg, a chicken has a breast, a chicken has a wing. That is not the only part, but it is just because of our preoccupation, our infatuation that was actually fed to us at a time when it was convenient to do so because Chicken was brought in as, as a poor man's food. That's what it was in the beginning, the poor man's food, okay? But because of the fact that we were fed this diet, that somehow chicken wings is something cheap, it was subsidized right through. And here it is that, for instance, our industry now in Barbados, okay, can, if given the opportunity, supply Barbados with 100% of the requirements of chicken meat. 100%. In other words, we don't need to import any chicken if it's given the opportunity, okay? Yet, we have this attempt on the part of per some persons in this country to convince Barbadians that they cannot live without a chicken wing. And we suck it up. And previous government, sadly, right? Have allowed that to happen. Well, we're in a situation right now that they much chicken wings around the place because in fact, you can't import it. So the local, the local sector have to step up to the plate. The, 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 these, are issues, these are fundamental issues that if you are serious about agriculture, that a government has to tackle. It has to say, look, we stand behind our local sector. The other point I wish to make in relation to the barbers like Belly Sheik. Right now, you, we, we talk to some, a lot of importers of land. And what we are seeing is that commodity markets around the world are changing now. You are seeing now, Prices of, and I, I know many of you who go to the supermarket now are wondering what's going on because the prices that you, you, you what you could have buy with a hundred dollars before you can't buy now. Things going up, food prices too. Okay, but what's happening now, right, is that even in terms of lamb, it is happening. And I, I say to myself, if enough attention is paid to our local lamb production, here again, okay is a way in which we can increase it. And again, I, I point to the role of the University of the West Indies in this regard. Because the amount of research that is required to help to improve the production of Barbados Black Belly Land, we need our research people here to play a greater role in terms of helping our working with our local farmers, not viewing it that they're doing them a favor, but working with our local farmers in order to help them to improve their production processes. This is the type of action that is required in order to improve our agricultural sector. That, that, that is basically what is required. And I, I really think that if we can get more initiatives like this, we will go very far.
Thank you, comrade. I will um, go to Andre and just ask you directly. Um, as the shadow speaker on agriculture, comrade, and as a future candidate for the St. John area, if you were to become the um, member of parliament, and let's say you were, you were, you were, you were looking, out, looking after the agricultural ministry, how do we really go about to reduce our food import bill from where it is? Okay, thanks, Corey. Uh, before I go into that, I wanted to also touch on the issue with the insurance as well, because I don't necessarily, I, in order for us to go forward seriously with agriculture, we need to be radical in terms of making opportunities for farmers who invest heavily in agriculture to be able to have suitable insurance plans. So I like the position put forward by Khalil Patel. And I also think it's something that the government would have to help in terms of underwriting these insurance policies. Because as a farmer, you invest in a crop and you could have heavy rainfall and you lose that entire crop. Or I, I don't necessarily think that, um, because there are farmers across the world that farm on much larger pieces of land that are possibly harder to police than what we do, but they still are able to get crop insurance. So we need to take a radical approach to the insurance sector in Barbados and sit down with them and find ways in which that persons can have some sort of insurance and security. That will be one step in terms of making sure that more persons will get involved in agriculture. We also need to look at financing because agriculture is not cheap to get into. So you also need to look at the financing as well. Things on the government side, you need to look at the land use policy. And I agree with, um, in terms of the land use, land use policy, we need to change. Once before, if you own over an acre of land and you wanted to qualify for um, the income tax, the land tax rate as a agriculture in agriculture, you just have to plant a few food, few trees on that property. These are things that we need to look at and we need to properly police and regulate. Do not allow you to claim um, pay the land tax rate for agriculture property just because you are have a few fruit trees, but when you pass, you see those fruits dropping on the ground and they're not going in to any market to be sold. So these are things that we also have to do. And I think that we need to look at our farming practices as well in terms of combining farming. The Scotland district, that is a prime area in terms of uh, fruit um, orchards. And as Mikael would have mentioned before, we need to develop food industries, the beverage industries in terms of our good um, guava punches and the yeah, cucumber and simple. ginger and all of those things. These are things that we need to do. So we need to not just sell the raw material or the first crop, but we need to get into production. And that is the way in which we can make agriculture viable in Barbados and it combined to our food security. More people want to eat fresh food. I believe that one of the things that we can target is lettuce. We should not be importing iceberg lettuce in Barbados, but I believe that we have the capacity that we should be able to produce the either the oak leaf lettuce or the regular local lettuce um, that we should be able to meet and supply um, that demand because you get a much better quality um, lettuce compared to the iceberg lettuce, which is imported um, into Barbados. So you get fresher um, produce. We also need to make better linkages with the tourism sector, which is one of the main importer of foods in Barbados. The tourism sector wants it is booming. This is an ideal opportunity to do that because our tourism sector right now is um, not as vibrant because of the impact of COVID. COVID. So make those link linkages with the hotels and the which has already started, and the chefs, that we can see, okay, could we organize ourselves a little better uh, between the tourism sector and the agricultural sector? What are the, the food items that you would look to market to the guests when they return and get more local produce on the plates? 
serving in hotels for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, utilizing more bread fruit, more ground provision. Um, you can do, do the regular things as well, but utilizing majority of the crops. And Barbadians are looking to eat healthy. You have things such as the slow food movement, all of those things, so that um, people who do breadfruit bowls, you make out licking with that. Um, things like that, breadfruit bowls, introduce them to raw sweet potatoes, the roast cassava, those sorts of things, and pickle them up. Do them in, the, in, in a nice Caribbean flavor. And also go to niche products too, such as products like rabbits and ducks, so that we can change the quality of protein that uh, we feed on. So it's not just chicken or fish or pork or beef, but introduce um, other proteins, healthier diets for persons as well, so that you can do rabbit um, rotis, duck rotis, all sorts of things, and have a healthier spread for persons. It, go piece by piece. Go at what we are good at. Also, we do it for sugar cane in terms of investing in the, um, the research in the different crop varieties for sugar cane and the seeds as well. Do the same thing for all of the products that we are look, looking at. I will go back to Karamita Fraser, who was before her time with her instant yam. This is the time for instant yam again in Barbados. And there are a number of different varieties of yams that we can play around with, the buck yams and all sorts of things that we can start reintroducing to the Barbadian table, um, these, these kinds of products. So, but we have to stop, and I am hoping that this government does not intend to sell off the Clico land, especially in St. John, to build housing or to expand too far into those fields with housing. I am watching closely the um, housing project in the area of Poole. The Democratic Labour Party started a housing project in that area where we basically made the fringe land, the land which was already close to the road that we said that we would sell that land for housing. The intention was not necessarily that we would take up all of that good agricultural land for housing, but you would use the areas which are already close to the roadways and close to the, um, the water means for housing, but you will still be able to do agriculture to the back of that. We need to, to not just think of building residential communities, but Barbados need to go to the step of having farming communities. So, because no, you cannot raise pigs and sheep in certain, and, and chickens in certain residential districts. So we still need to supply that sort of space where persons are able to do that sort of um, backyard farming. And that is not, if you go from tenant trees to development, you cannot do that kind of backyard farming uh, with your pigs, your sheep, and stuff like that. So you need to really look at our um, tongue and country planning policy or land use policy so that you are still able to do um, sheep farming, uh, raise your pigs, because you often find, I encountered one young man in St. John. He basically was raising pigs for all his life but encountered a challenge with his neighbor who basically wanted him, he stopped raising the pigs because the neighbor was complaining for the, for the scent and that frustrated him. Now, I think situations like that is unfair because he is in a rural farming community, but yet so you have um, one or two neighbors who will be causing you problems because of the, um, they don't want you to get involved in your livestock um, production and that is what helps you to pay your bills. That is what keeps um, someone like him employed. So we need to have that balance in terms of residential and agriculture and maintain a good set of our land for agriculture, especially in the areas of the Scotland district. And the government should be hard and fast. Whatever land is in agricultural production now, keep it there because there are other techniques that you can utilize to make these lands um, productive. You um, you farm in between, you do um, crop farming in between the orchards and stuff like that, those sorts of things, so that you would have a mixed rotation 
in terms of your agricultural policy. So these are the sort of things that I would like to look at. Agriculture is still necessary for Barbados as an economy. We need not only to look at it as an income earner, but sometime we may need to be able to feed ourselves. We can't just depend on the canned corn coming into Barbados because something may happen to stop that canned corn from making it here. But if we got sweet potatoes in the ground and cassava, we can still get a decent meal. Comrade Andre, I love your, your comments. I love your suggestions and your ideas. I, I certainly agree with you that we may just need to become the primary um, suppliers of our own food in the not too distant future. I mean, there's climate control that we must take into consideration, the impact of climate control, and so many other natural disasters which continue to threaten us, which we're not accustomed to. Before I move on to Mikhail, we have a couple of questions I'm going to get to, but first I want to introduce our president the piece. I'm just going to give her the opportunity to come and address the Semico Central virtual branch meeting. Good evening to you, Comrade President. Good evening. Uh, just give me one moment. Let me turn the video on. Yes. Good evening to all of you. I hope you all have been enjoying this as much as I have. Um, I, I just want to speak for one moment about young Mikel Rogers and his passion for agriculture. I know that as party members, you're familiar with comrade James Paul and his role in agriculture in Barbados, and that you're familiar with comrade Andre Worrell and the wonderful job he's been doing for the last three years as our spokesperson on agriculture. But I want you to know that the young man, Mikael Rogers, was sufficiently composed enough that when I first became president, he sought an audience with me and wanted me to know where he was at with agriculture and what he expected to see from agriculture in the near future and definitely under the Democratic Labour Party. So when I saw that he was part of this panel, I mentioned to Corey that I was very excited about his panel and that I definitely had to be here. And I have not been disappointed so far. We have in agriculture a way of supporting ourselves outside of tourism. And this has bec become a stark reality in this COVID environment, but it should have been a focus of ours for some time. I see a comment from Comrade Mapp saying that she's happy to say that she is a, a customer of Comrade Mikel, and I hope that more of you will join her in becoming one of his clients. You, if you have him on your phone, you will see his passion because he always has his produce on display, he'll he'll take a picture with a piglet and all, and he you can you get the excitement and his interest in this area. But where we are at right now in agriculture is such an interesting and exciting time as far as I'm concerned. Yes, we have been forced in this direction by world events, and it is not just COVID, but the stories coming out in relation to just simply getting commodities here, especially coming from China, is the, the cost of shipping has doubled in a lot of instances, but it's definitely increased astronomically. And some of it is due to the Suez Canal blockage, but a lot of it has to do with the general impact of COVID across the world and all the cost of doing business in agriculture has gone up. So it is time now for Barbados to look at agriculture very, very seriously. And not just the facets that have been spoken of, but one that appeals to me that I haven't heard mentioned so far is how we treat black belly sheep. To my mind, the black belly sheep is more than the meat, but those skins are exceptional quality leather. And we need to keep that in mind that there is an industry outside of the obvious and that we have reached that stage in Barbados where we need to be developing beyond the, the primary phase or even the secondary phase and looking at all the different ways that we can use all the different types of agriculture that we have. 
And I'm thinking in terms of jams and preserves, we already do the pepper sauces and things of that nature. But, but when we are finished satisfying our need, then these are commodities that we can use also to bring in revenue to Barbados. So I'm really very interested in this discussion. I'm not really sure how much longer it will go on, but I am not tired of it yet. I came here to learn. I came here to listen. I am not in any way disappointed. I just want to add one more thing in relation to Comrade James Paul. For about 20 years now, all new builds over a certain size must harvest water from the roof. It is a requirement to get your town and country planning completion certificate. However, there has not been any system in relation to what you do with that water afterwards. I have those tanks at my house. I use the water to power wash the house and the driveway. But how often do you do that? It rains in St. Thomas almost every day. I don't need to water my garden with it and no one comes and collects it. Every couple of years, I actually do have to let it out because I have to clean the tanks and the water just flows down the hill. So we really do need to think of water in a completely different way. I am not satisfied that we really are a water scarce country. I think that we don't do enough to secure the water that we do have. And these are steps and things that we have to think about going forward. But I am willing to listen and hear all of the different thoughts that are coming out of this panel. And believe me, I've been taking notes all night long. So I, I really am pleased that we have this opportunity to learn. And ah, I beg your pardon, I was reading a comment from Comrade Maxine that she shared with Comrade Corey a suggestion in relation to how we use that water. And I hope that she will share it with the rest of us. So to everyone present, please enjoy the rest of tonight. Open your minds, let it be a learning experience and that it will enrich us and that we will view agriculture in a much different light going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Comrade President. 66 years, this great party has been in existence and 66 more years and even more to go. I'm actually hoping that based off of our life expectancy that I will have a chance to see our 100 year anniversary, our centennial anniversary. So I will keep my fingers crossed. Let me just take a couple of questions quickly. Um, Marcia Miller, good evening to you. If there's no Marcia Miller there available, and I see a hand also from Audrey Street. Comrade Audrey Street, are you there? See, we also had um, Mrs. Stetson Bob who wanted to ask the panel a question. Stetson Bob. Hi, good evening, Corey. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. This is Comrade Ski. Good evening. Yes, please. Yes, good evening, Arwen. How are you doing? Um, I am doing okay. I'm glad that you are having this discussion this evening about agriculture. I, too, myself, have been involved in agriculture practically all my life. And I would do anything that is feasible when it comes to agriculture. And this discussion is something feasible, so I find myself taking part in it this evening. There are a few things that I would like to put on the table in this discussion. Some of them have been mentioned already, but I will just gloss over some of them. One of the first things that comes to my mind when we are talking about agriculture is that as a country, not as a sector, as a country, we don't take agriculture seriously. We always take agriculture as a way out, or as you say, as an excuse. And just like the discussion we are having now, when we are looking at the, re the, the repercussions of the ash fall in St. Vincent or COVID, those are excuses. But agriculture need not be put in that bracket Agriculture is a livelihood and an economic pillar for Barbados if taken seriously just as important as vital as tourism or international business, if we do it right. But if we continue to take it in those excuse formats, we are going nowhere fast. And agriculture is intrinsically linked to every sector in Barbados and you look at it holistically. Take for instance, you have the tourism sector. 
Our culture provides for the tourism sector. Our culture provides for the manufacturing sector when we do agribusiness. The spin-off is there as well. When it comes to the Barbados Water Authority, agriculture is vitally important to them as they are important to agriculture. The, the main thing that bothers me sometimes is that information and access for farmers. And I'll say this, we have people who got involved in agriculture, like I said before, as an excuse. A man loses his job today, he finds, uh, he comes into contact with a, a few dollars being retrenched, and he says he's going to get it in agriculture. But agriculture needs to be taken much more seriously because if you don't have a serious love for agriculture, at the first outset of frustration, you're going to give up. Because farmers suffer significant losses with the simplest of ease. A man can be growing a, a, a farm of livestock or chicken. And at a given day, the temperature rises in the atmosphere. Those chickens could die just before they're ready to harvest. And those are things that set back farmers significantly. And that's where we tie in the, in, the, the, the argument about insurance. One of the problems that farmers in Barbados have is that I think more farmers need to form cooperative. When you have when people speak with one voice, it's heard much louder and it's understand better, and we can move forward united and collectively. If the farmers form more cooperatives and take their pleas and their passion to insurance companies and show them the viability of having insurance policies tailor-made for agriculture, it can be viable. The same way how you, how you can insure a car for a whole year and never have an accident. A farmer can have a, a, a policy for a whole year to and never, seek, and never seek a claim or a house that never burns down when you have it for 30 or 40 years. The same thing can happen to agriculture uh, policies as well. One of the things that happen is that data, not enough data is given to farmers. Take, for instance, you have 20 farmers in Barbados scattered all across this island planting potatoes, sweet potatoes. We need to have empirical data which shows farmers the correct use of the, the plant and the potatoes, showing them which soil types are better preferable that you can get a greater yield, especially where you're located, where you get rain water harvesting, or you can get lower rainfall or higher rainfall that can increase the yield or decrease the yield in your crop. Same thing could go for tomatoes and other food crops that we normally grow. We talk about um, rainwater harvesting. Recently, we had, I think, the last 12 or so years, we had passed the Renewable Energy Bill. And we gave incentives for people to use photovoltaic and renewable energy and sell back to the grid. Why can't we put an incentive like that in place for people who harvest water to the water authority? We also have a situation where we do not have for livestock farmers a consistent and a readily available feed sector in Barbados. Too often, the company that is the main manufacturer of feed in Barbados is out of pertinent feed for farmers. And when they do have the feed sometimes, it's not of the high quality that is normally that is, and animals suffer the loss of life or growth, or the product is not as, as, as consistent as it ought to be. One of the other things that I had to mention is we can encourage, James Paul was talking about it earlier about the university obtaining the land at um, Jukes and St. Thomas. Why can't that land be used uh, and the university students come up with more local herbicides to help the farmers who are planting um, crops to deal with things like leaf miners and that kind of stuff that would be helpful and, and more organic than the imported pesticides that we normally see people using all the time. We also have to look at utilizing the fruits and vegetables when we have gluts. We have a tourism, a vital tourism industry. And instead of just letting fruits fall on the ground, we can start making pubs and syrups that can use in the formation of drinks that we see a lot of the hotel sector imports in Barbados. We also have to look at the rum industry and see how we can tie in the blending of the fruits with the rum industry and get them exported to make important uh, foreign currency for Barbados. We have to look at a proper canning facility in Barbados where we have the same food crops that can be canned and exported. I see Barbados importing coconut water, 
we import in cherries, we import in all kinds of things. The same thing that we can grow here, we can export them as well. But we need a proper facility that can do the canning and stuff for, for export. Carameters had a, a, a significant product there that they were using, they're making meat sorbets and stuff. We can have some people do some more indigenous foods that are, are superior to the ones that are imported and get them on the market. And this can help more farmers to more and more persons to be employed in the farming sector and bring down the, the unemployment bill in Barbados and see and let people see that agriculture is a viable entity and not just an excuse that people normally use it as. Those are just some of the few things that I would like to put on the table for now. Right. Comrade Skid, I want to thank you so much for that contribution. And I will um I know um that somebody have head of news affairs at Starcom Network, you wanted to ask a panel a question. Are you there, Mr. Bob? All right, I will go to Comrade Maxine McLean. I know she had a few comments as it pertains to the role that the University of the West Indies Cafel have been, has been playing in agriculture development in Barbados. Comrade Maxine. Yes, um, I hope my television isn't disturbing you guys a bit away from me, but if it is, I have to stop and go and get it. I, well, I, I just commented, that wasn't my main intention. That I just made a comment to suggest to, and I sent a, a comment directly to you, but I was just saying I know a bit more about that project, but that's not what I, I want to focus on. What I wanted to suggest, and I think um, Comrade Verla touched on it when she talked about the requirement for, for tanks. And I believe that we need to have a little bit of creative thinking about those properties not involved in agriculture. Um, and, and this can be coordinated through a farmer's co-op or it can be coordinated through the BAS. I, and, and it can involve the, the development of tanks, uh, you know, a tanker of something that can collect that water. I believe that if um, farmers have storage tanks, those houses that routinely are required to collect that water, and as Verla said, most, most houses tend to have that because a lot of houses do not even have grounds that they can utilize the water fully. And that can be collected and farmers can buy it at a, at a, at a, a nominal rate. I mean, because, and you know, if you look at the cost of, of by getting water supplied by the water authority, um, you can see how significant savings. So it can be a joint purchase um, on the cooperative arrangement of some water, a couple water tankers, which can collect and distribute the water um, from those people who have those tanks and for people who can actually erect tanks to collect the water Within, within such of a, uh, such a scheme. Andre raised the question of financing because as I listened to the problems, I was here writing solutions to all of those problems or what are some possible solutions. I go back again to the existing major pharma organization, which is the BAS. And my suggestion is that with the continued excessive liquidity in the commercial banking sector, the Barbados Agricultural Society or a group of farmers under a co-op co or company or whatever structure they want, can conceptualize an investment scheme where passive or angel investors can be invited to invest in some agricultural ventures. And my preference would be for those kinds of ventures which through the use of technology, which um, are designed in an integrated way from cultivation to processing can offer significant potential for, for returns to, to the investors. So in essence, I'm suggesting that there is money out there sitting in commercial banks primarily that are not attracting interest that are in fact, you're paying the banks to keep for you. And, and I'll give an example because I know of several agricultural projects, but one project that came to mind some couple of years ago, I know that there was a significant effort to cultivate breadfruit intended to produce breadfruit flour. The idea was to make pasta um, because they were looking at growing several acres of breadfruit um, because such a product would be attractive to people who are gluten intolerant. Um, so I think that that is, that is critical. And I want to just quickly respond, if I might, to some important points that have been raised um, in relation to data collection. Again, we have a lot of bright young people who are computer savvy, um, who understand statistics, and who can actually create a business opportunity for themselves by working with farmers who are willing to share the information, because you mentioned the, the need for, um, uh, I think you're looking at 
when you're talking about production, you're talking about deal, issues of disease and knowing what they are and so on. And I think that farmers can be supported by, by persons like that who can collect, develop a system where information is fed in, you have a sense of production. And the last point I want to make, I think I might have put it in the public, in, in the chat for everyone, is that it may be a little bit dated now because it was done a few years ago, but it certainly is a starting point. Dr. Um, Chelston Braffitt, who later became the ambassador to China, when he, he's re, he used to head the regional body, um, AICA, and he came back home and he, de, he was working with the Ministry of Agriculture. I have a copy of the document. I've, I've lent it to people from time to time, and I'm sure the Ministry of Agriculture can, can, can provide it where he looked at the importation of a wide cross section of fruits and vegetables. Um, he looked at the production levels in Barbados and he looked at consumption. And a simple analysis of that can tell you where opportunities are. Um, if you look at cucumbers, pumpkins, lettuces, tomatoes, okras, whatever, it gave a, a, a good idea of how much we consume. And in almost every instance, we were way below um, the, the, the satisfying the, the demand from local production, which suggests to me that there is scope. And I say finally, but there's one other question that I have. Um, and this is a question, does anybody have BAS or anybody an idea of the volume or quantity and mix of produce supplied by St. Vincent and the Grenadines? And how does that break out into short, medium and long-term crops? And I ask that because if you have a sense particularly of short-term crops, people can quickly look to produce some of those because we know that St. Vincent is not going to find itself able to supply the region because they supplied Trinidad significantly in the past to supply the region in the short term. So if you look at those short term crops, you can get a sense, of course, of what is consumed here. We also will have to ask ourselves, given the, the situation in, the, in tourism, how much of that is consumed by households. But I'm just saying that I keep hearing problems, but I, for every time I hear a problem, my mind goes to what are possible solutions. I was listening to the news tonight and I heard the Minister of Agriculture put something on the table, which we, I, I, we would have discussed in, 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 in previous times, whether it was in presentations in, in, in the Senate or whatever. I'm, I've heard members of this party speak to it. And they are talking now about creating opportunities to invest in agriculture. That sounds good, but I would, su I would suggest that any investment schemes should be worked out with farmers looking and choosing the people who they want to invest in, certainly in the short term, rather than looking at some other options. So I, I, I think I went through those quickly, but I just wanted to share those because I think there's so many, as the president said, this is exciting times, but we have the capacity to make it more exciting by mobilizing our resources, whether it's our intellectual resources, our financial resources, um, our consumer buying power to make a difference in terms of agriculture. And the, and the last, last thing, because I, I looked at the paper here, I, I, I can't help writing. I think somebody made reference to, to, to production and investment out, outside of Barbados. We already have a number of arrangements in place. You, you're hearing a lot every time you're talking TV about Suriname. That was a, that was a, the, the most recent iteration of that was something which would have been negotiated when we were in office. It is called a, a joint commission where you meet and look at investment opportunities or business opportunities in different sectors. We have that, a similar arrangement with Guyana and Suriname, Guyana and Belize are three of the biggest land areas in the CARICOM. And while we're looking to produce here, we also recognize the constraints of size, but we can also look at the strength of the Barbados dollar as we look to engage some of these also as a means of investment and creating the kind of um, volume if we start looking at exporting through um, processing and so on. So I hope that some of those can give us some, some thoughts to run with in a very serious way. Thanks, um, Corey. Thank you so much, Carmen McLean, for your comments. And as we bring our meeting to a close, I want to go back to the panel. For those of you who join us late, we have directly, we have CEO of the Barbados Agriculture Society and former MP for St. Michael West Central, James Paul, along with agriculture spokesman for the Democratic Labour Party and, uh, who, and the candidate for St. John, 
in the upcoming elections, Mr. Andre Worrell, along with Young Democrat, and agro businessman Miguel Rogers. And let me second what the president, the pizza said earlier. I too am a customer of Miguel, and um, I particularly get a lot of his sweet potatoes. And he has the sweetest potatoes, not just sweet potatoes, but actually the sweetest potatoes. So I actually gave you a plug there, my brother. Um, as we wrap up, I'm going to come to Mr. Paul for his parting comments. But in addition to that, I also want to just ask you to give us an update on what the Barbados Agriculture Society and the committee, the planning committee for AgroFest will be doing, considering that this is now, I think, the second year that we've been unable to have an AgroFest. Mr. Paul? Okay. Um, First, let me just correct you though. This is the first year. This is the first year. That's, I was I was wondering I was I was wondering about that. We had it last year, right? Agrofest was there last year. Right. Just okay. before the shutdown, we were lucky enough to be able to hold Agrofest. Yeah, yeah. And it was just before the shutdown, right. so we were able to hold Agrofest last year. Um this year, however, you know, we have a different right. challenge. Um certainly, yes, um, it cannot have, cannot be held in February, and you know, we still have a state of emergency on. And looking at the regulations as they are right now, it, you know, I don't think things are worked out to the point where we can have a mass-based event as a stand. So it is a very unlike, unlikely that we'll be hold, able to hold an agrofest this year. I mean, um, and of course, it means negotiating with sponsors and everything else. Um, it, is, it, it does look very difficult if you look at what is happening in the country at the moment. So basically, we are planning towards agrofest 2022. You know. Um, we, we may have some activities uh, um, around that in terms of trying to prepare people, and that is something that we are looking at. Um, you, 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 you asked for my final comments, so I just want to state this. Uh, sometimes when you listen to people, I don't think that we are aware that many of the things people are asking for, they're already happening in the sector. What is required is greater support. What is required is a greater commitment of resources towards making them bigger. For instance, we talk about the whole quest of the further possessing of agricultural produce. I don't know if many people know, but we have actually, that has, is an operation that has already been started in Barbados. Where, for instance, we have the sweet potato fries, which are actually being made in Barbados by a farmer. One of the issues of course in, in the production of sweet potato fries is the fact that you have, the variety, however, must be right. And of course, the whole question of um, you know the, the other challenges, but th th these are things that are happening. I also want to add something. I do agree um, with Martin when she talked about that the BS needs to have a program on the things that we are looking to start as a result of us recognizing that there are persons who have large underground tanks who have water beneath them not being used. One of the things we are looking to do is acquire a tanker, and then what we are going to actually do is to encourage those farmers who are engaged in production to have tanks on their lands. And basically we, there will be some place where we can actually take the water and put it in a tank. It's gonna cost, that's the whole thing. It's gonna be a cost, but that is something of course too that is being looked at and we're looking to see how we can organize the, the financing for that. The, the other point too, I wish, wish, wish to make is this, that we talk about the whole question of soil suitability and knowing what it is. Soil sampling is something that's being done in Barbados. It may not be a real, as a matter of fact, most good farmers would actually try and make sure that they can get soil samples before they even try to plant a crop because you know each plant requires different things from the soil. And you have to, and not only that, even in the application of fertilizers, you have to be sure that you're actually applying the right type of fertilizer. And there's a service that is available by, by a company that is here that of course farmers can get that. However, I go back to the point though, I, I really think need to be stressed. We need to stop agricultural land in Barbados being compromised. And one of the things too, I, I, I must know is that while we are trying to get as many farm, farmers as persons as possible involved in agriculture, let us face the facts. It is not everyone who have the necessary skill and acumen to be involved. And I, and I think that somehow sometimes I get the sense as if Agriculture is being used as a political football of political vote catcher in order to basically get persons to, you know, to vote. That's not it. We need to attract serious people in agriculture 
who have the necessary technical skills and technical acumen in order to produce goods. And one of the points I wish to note is this. We have to be careful that the, site, the land sizes that we are actually allotting to be with the firm is actually below what I will call the viable optimum. We seem to forget each time that we are in a tropical environment. And because we are in a tropical environment, our soils are what we will call leach soils, which is very different to the alluvial soils that are contained in the temperate north because it does not, they do not retain nutrient properties in the uppermost part of the soil as readily. So you see, when we give a farmer an acre of land to farm, the question that almost I always ask myself, are we thinking that a farmer can really make feed his family and make a go on this? No, because one of the things we have to guard against is the splitting up of agricultural land to less than viable economic units. And that is a danger. That is one of the threats I will want to identify to agriculture, that we need to ensure that when we do give lands to persons, that they have a viable economic unit that they can make money from. Money from. Too often, people who don't understand agriculture walk around and they might see a section of the farmer's land in, in grass. And they say, what a total waste of it. By the way, grass is an agricultural product because we need grass as we are discovering how to feed the animals, okay, or of, of, of uh, forage. And the truth is really, the reason why cane production has been so successful as a grass crop in Barbados is because of the fact that we rotate with grass. So you might have a section of the land that is resting, but it is under grass because what is happening, the land is resting and, it's, and the grass helps it to, re helps it to retain the nutrient properties that the continued cultivation of other agricultural crops will actually take out. So it is sometimes, when I hear people who are not involved in agriculture directly, coming with some of these things, it shows sometimes that we show a level of impatience in understanding agricultural techniques and procedures, which sometimes contribute to the failures that we are seeing in agriculture. And I, I, I want to stress that I, I really believe that one of the big challenges that we face as we go forward is the fact that how can we con prevent the continued alienation of agricultural land? Because it is under considerable threat in this new environment that we are in, where we have these speculators that are coming in, taking up agricultural land, and all the intention is, is to try to build a house in which they feel that they can make some money from it. And at the end of the day, the land is spoiled. And sometimes we talk about living in, in, in an eco, eco sensitive environment. And sometimes I really don't think that people do understand that in terms of the environment, agriculture contributes much more to the management of the environment than for instance, taking concrete and compromising that particular piece of land. I thank you very much for allowing me to make a contribution. Thank you, Comrade Paul. I, I fully support what you're saying. I know from my end over in Christchurch, we see lots of land in the stable growth plantation area, which is now being used for 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 for, for building. There's I think we're Black Mongolopis now is actually a former cane grown. The plot of land that People's Cathedral was intending to build their new church on was a former plot of um, was formerly a cane grown also. And then there's a whole rich plantation that is now used for, for, for building, and it really concerns you. I'm going to go to Mikhail Rogers. I think that we really need to have a land use policy. We really need to have a serious upgraded land use policy. And I go back to even medicinal cannabis, the fact that, that persons are not going to come in and speak about how fertile the land is here for, for cannabis to grow and this and that. And we need to have an upgraded plan to ensure that we are not Open up for one opportunity while maybe cursing ourselves or damning ourselves with regards to another opportunity. There's no reason having a house without having food. I will go to you, Mikel, for your parting words as a businessman and as you go toward another 66 years as a young Democrat, as a practitioner in agriculture. What are you hoping to see? What can you see as a collection of farmers doing to take us forward? Uh well, I, I want to see more solutions and less talk. Uh, I already talk. I only, I'm, I'm only 25 years old, and I can tell Andre and Mr. Paul, we've been talking for the last 65 years, and I think the founding member of this party said some words that 
I wish you didn't see every day. You should not see a, a last king and cutter somewhere on that line going ahead. But I think the the, the water problems uh, in the uh, face the agriculture sector. I think I think we got to come to a decision where we get some desal plants and we, we drink desal water and use whatever water we find either at Bormiston or either the pumping stations and use it for agriculture. I think that's a better way you will use secure that um, that water. And you more look at food sovereignty right more than and, and not look at food security. Um, and I think that will tackle the water issue. Um, I think the co-ops, I didn't touch on this part, but I think we got to have stronger co-ops. I think the co-ops aren't really pulling away uh, because most of the issues in insurance and thing, I mean, I, mean, I, I know one farm in particular mentioned the issue with the pitting larceny where in Jamaica, the Jamaican BDF goes around and helps surveil. You know, they got the Jamaican BDF uh, security forces to go around and cut down on the teething of the crops and, and that helps, you know. I think the co-ops can go ahead as a collective and keep going. So there's some more solutions to the factor. Um, just to touch on what Mr. Paul said, and the, I can't remember the guy who mentioned about people just coming into agriculture. I, I think that's the issue we have it, because in 91, we had the same problem where job cuts were there. I wasn't born yet, but the statistics shows where people just jumped into agriculture, and, and as soon as you had an economic boom, boom, they, the market fell out. Um, this year is happening again, um, and a lot of people enjoy it when they see the money, and then as soon as the money gets tight, they, they're gone. Um, giving a farmer one acre is a joke, in my opinion. And I think instead of looking for people just to get an agriculture, there are some young people out there like myself. I had it real hard trying to get a piece of land from the government and is yet turn around the BA, the MC, in my opinion, want shutting down because they may doing nothing. Um, they have car meters there for years and we yet to find anything that we can export. And, and, and someone in the chat had mentioned something they said about food industries. If we had food industries, I'll, I'll, I'll close on this point. The problem of encouraging people to get an agriculture would be there. Burger King, Chefet, and all the other franchises will find a reason to come here as increasing jobs more food will be produced because these they have certain people here responsible for producing certain things. And we won't have to worry about the food bill because I heard Corey mention food bill is 300 million. And I think the food bill needs to be bred off for everybody to understand. A hundred million dollars is wines and beverages that are, are imported. And then a hundred million is processed foods, scanned foods. And when I mean, you look at raw produce, the raw produce is not even, a, if they say only up to 40 million or, or even less. And for a country like Barbados, we can't produce everything, which is, is good, but we need to improve in that industry. And, and I mean, we can go on and on and talk at 12 o'clock tonight on the issues of agriculture, but the water issue, I think, like I said, again, we got to come to decision if we can use a portable water you find on the island or drink the, the salt water, and that problem will be solved because there are some springs we can take water from and, and just go from there, but just find solutions to the problems and there are easy solutions. Just work together the country and we'll find them together. Really, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Miguel, for your time tonight. And I come last but not least to the current um, channel speaker in agriculture, esteemed John candidate, Andrea Worrell, as you go toward another 66 years. Last year, agriculture was the only sector which actually grew in terms of revenue attaining. I do want to know what is your perspective on agriculture as you go forward as a nation and then as, a, as a party as we play our role, our further role in the development and growth of Barbados and especially in agriculture. Okay, thank you, Corey. And yes, you're very correct. Um, true COVID, agriculture has shown itself to be a resilient sector. And I think it is time that we take it off of the back burner and we place the sector at the same level as which we will place the tourism sector, the manufacturing industry, and we 
elevate the level of farmers in Barbados and start providing them with the level of financial support to make the agricultural sector in Barbados viable. We can do this by one, looking at the way how we offer incentives. We offer our incentives at the back end through the rebates, you pay first and then you get it. Whereas for the tourism sector, they give you the money up front. So start offering those incentives to the agricultural sector up front. And I think that would help in terms of boosting the interest. Right now, persons are interested in agriculture and it is a highly technical industry. So we will need to see the um, persons from the various agencies, the Barbados Agricultural Society coming out there and playing their part in terms of the marketing and the coordination of the agricultural sector. Um, the BADMC, the um, persons within the Ministry of Agriculture as well, um, going out there and offering a technical advice to the farmers. So those, these are the things that we need to do. We can do a lot with agriculture in Barbados. Look at it, not just in terms of the, the ground provision and the produce that you produce, but go the extra mile in terms of developing the cottage industries. There's a, a business in Barbados called Novelty Teas. These are different areas that we can go with the herbs. Um, most of you would know of the um, Searchy Bush and uh, the Bush Tea. All of those are things that we should be able to um, turn into revenue earners for Barbadians in terms of even growing um, those, the appropriate bush and put them together because I am certain that if you send the average young person into the field to collect the appropriate bush to make a good bush tea, they wouldn't be able to do it. But these are, are, are weeds that would grow easily in any area. So how could we package those things into a tea bag that we can sell to persons in California who are in, into this healthy lifestyle and start to not just sell things for pennies, but you know, put the premium market on our products that would really help to make the agricultural sector in Barbados a viable industry. We import coconut water from as far as Indonesia. Why can't we in Barbados do the same here in terms of our coconut water and export that as well? So there is tremendous potential for agriculture and we need to move away from that mindset that agriculture is hard labor, start utilizing the technology and start removing the stumbling blocks. We haven't dealt with things such as the monkeys, predial, predial larceny. We need to just increase the penalties um, for that so that, you know, make things comfortable for persons to get into agriculture. Financing at the banks, um, through the cooperatives, and get marketing experts on board so that you can deal with the packaging and how you produce and put out and start to develop the various, the linkages and move the agricultural sector beyond Barbados, but also see Barbadian farmers taking advantage of the large land space that is available in places such as Guyana, Suriname, Belize, and all take a agricultural business in Barbados and you'll be responsible for growing produce in other parts of the Caribbean and you bringing or packaging those products and selling them other areas because we can't do all here. But like I said earlier, the agricultural sector globally is a $2.4 trillion industry and we can do a whole lot more by even just concentrating on 1 billion US dollars of that industry in Barbados and then from there grow it to two and continue to grow it each year. We can do that by, you know, start putting agriculture on the same level as the tourism industry and all of the other fancy industries. We can do it. Agriculture is no longer backward. It is possibly the industry that would help to take Barbados forward. Most growing economies have a vibrant agricultural sector. The US does, Brazil does, India and India has a vibrant agricultural sector as long as as well as China. So just because Barbados is small does not mean that we cannot do more in our agricultural sector. We have cotton, 
So you utilize the cotton in terms of textile, and again, it goes into the creative industry. Same message which um, the President Verlo de Pisa placed in terms of the, the, the skin from the black belly sheet. There are a number of different areas that we can go into. We haven't even talked about the horticultural industry. For years, Barbados every year, well, not this year, would go to the Chelsea Flower Shore and win gold or close to our silver gilt in that so we have a vibrant horticulture industry which we can also develop people buy one of the areas that have been booming during this covid period is the horticultural sector because you you were not able to go to a friend to wish them happy birthday or celebrate with them at a wedding or the number of persons who have died but persons have been buying the flowers um you know as tributes as to still show that connection. So that is yet another vibrant industry that we can um, tie into as well. So agriculture is not dead. And the Democratic Labour Party, and as far as I am concerned, I would look in everywhere possible to bring more people into the agricultural sector, starting with the backyard, kitchen gardens, uh, who have, even if you can just raise 10 chickens, things like that. We need to start those small projects to get people interested and in growing more of the food that they eat. And if we start at that stage, it will begin to develop into a movement and spread. And we would recognize how viable the agricultural sector in Barbados could be. I thank you so much, Comrade Andre World. I want to thank all of you who joined us here, St. Michael Central members also. I want to thank all of you who joined us for this discussion as this good party celebrates our 66 years of existence and 66 years is by no means a small feat or an easy feat to achieve. I also want to extend belated birthday greetings to our former prime minister and comrade Fandel Stewart who celebrated his 70th birthday yesterday on the same exact day of the DLB. He actually was born before the Democratic Labour Party so I hope that one day we can have a conversation with him and just look at the years as the Democratic Labour Party passed through all of them. I hope we can go to see another six or six years. I wanna thank all of you for joining with us, the members of the media who also attended. And I wanna wish all of you a safe night and drive safely as you go to your respective homes as Comrade Paulette Drake would always say. It's a real pop it, boy. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I get home safe for you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'm going to another meeting. <laughs>